all of which is a little weird and cold blood, but there it is. At the same time, there is no life to be lived. And to remind you, these are many people with education, people who used to go abroad, people who have PhDs and master's degrees, who can't do anything. The Palestinian Authority pays 80 or 90,000 people to not go to work in order to protest against Hamas's takeover of Gaza two and a half years ago. So you have a lot of educated people with nothing to do. And for, you know, it, it, my sense is that the place is getting more and more isolated, and that only adds to the attraction of radicalism, or at least one could argue that it adds to that. I don't think we know that much about what attracts people to radicalism, because it turned out when we saw on September 11th that it's not as simple as poverty and misery. The, the other thing that's very interesting for a reporter in my position is that the difference in accessibility to information in both sides of the story. So in Israel, you have an amazing access to members of the Knesset and the government. You have everyone's phone number. There is sort of all day long a chatter in the country. If you were to uh, each morning turn have two radios and turn one to the state radio station and the other to the army radio station, between 6 a.m. and noon, there is nothing but talk. And virtually the entire government is being yelled at in the course of that morning. Every expert gets on. You, you could, if you wanted to, in my position, never get out of bed, listen to the two sets of radio take notes, and then write your story. I've never done that. I'm not telling you I have never done it. I'm just saying you could. On the Palestinian side, there is not that kind of open dialogue as there is not across the Arab world. And there is no investigative journalism. Uh, and in Israel, there's a fair amount of it. So I, as an outsider, I, as a, I'm a journalist in another country. I'm not creating investigations. I'm sort of creating off the conversation that's going on in the place and presenting it to you. There's not that much of a conversation to cream off in the Palestinian section of it. There is, but it's very hard to get to. And publicly, there aren't columnists saying that the government is uh, doing bad things the same way there is on the Israeli side. And that makes for a, an imbalance in the coverage of the place, which I regret and want to try to fix, but it's very hard to fix because I can't create a dialogue that isn't there. You actually have that across the rest of the Arab world as well. It's very hard to get visas to those places for journalists. We haven't, you know, New York Times has not gotten into Iran since the election. Before the election, it was two years before a reporter could get in. Very hard to get into Sudan, very hard to get into Saudi, to Syria, to all of these countries. And then when you finally get in, you're given a 10 day visa and nobody will talk to you. When you finally are about to leave, the deputy agriculture minister rings you and suggests tea on the way to the airport. And that's your source. That you, so it's quite a problem quite a problem to cover these countries in the kind of depth that they deserve to be covered. And it is also true that in those countries, people don't write about themselves because they're not permitted to. And so the result is that there's a lot of talk in those countries about Israel. So that there is an incredible sophistication of knowledge about Israeli politics in Jordan and Saudi Arabia. And, and it's sort of bizarre. You'll, if you Go through the exercise, which I have often done, of buying the Jerusalem Post, taking a taxi to the Alamby Bridge, and then taking a taxi up to Amman, Jordan, and buying the Jordan Times and comparing them. They both talk about the same thing. What's the future of Kadima? Which is extraordinary when you think about it. As I said, the situation is grim in the sense that I see no clear horizon for negotiations that are going to get anywhere. I would love to be wrong. Uh, first of all, it would be a better story, but I, and, and maybe I will be. There is a, a great Palestinian intellectual named Sari Museva, who's the president of Al Quds University in East Jerusalem, who wrote a, a beautiful book a few years ago, and in it he said that uh, his father once told him that rubble makes the best building material. I don't know if that's true, but if it is true, I think we're in luck in the Middle East because we've got a lot of rubble and a lot of building to do. 
At the moment, the Palestinians' position is, unless there's a freeze in the building in East Jerusalem, we are not going to go back to the table. And the Israeli attitude is, East Jerusalem is not going to be frozen. It belongs to Israel. So it's hard to see how we're going to uh, get past this impasse at the moment. But I will say something else, which is that in the 1990s, when I covered the place for the Boston Globe, there was such high expectation that peace was around the corner. It was almost like the market had already accepted the correction. It's going to happen. Let's move on. And then it blew up in everyone's face with a lot of uh, violence, both from and to the West Bank, that in a certain way, my remaining, my last thought for you uh, is that maybe the low expectations will serve, at, and while well, we're all assuming that nothing possibly good can happen, that the Mitchell people and the Israelis and the Palestinians, with the help of the Europeans and the other Arab countries, will be doing quiet work and will wake up one day and find out that they figured something out. I wouldn't bet on it, but I wouldn't completely discount it either. Thank you very much. from our government is bad, obviously. But listening to your talk, I think you do a fantastic job as a spokesperson for IDF and Israeli government, mainly, I think, because you talk to them too much. Let me tell you one thing. Goldstone Report, for example, New York Times had a thousand pages describing it. The rebuttal from the Israeli military like the El Barter things, which you didn't even write in the initial September report. You wrote 1,300 words. How can we possibly trust you as what you describe a difficult job? Last question. Do you have a son in IDF, yes or no? Thank you. My son joined the IDF five weeks ago. The first question. You know, we wrote about the Goldstone Report when it came out, out of the UN. But to me, it's not so much the Goldstone Report that matters. We wrote a huge amount about Gaza when it happened, and in the weeks after, a huge amount. But you didn't study the victims. I'm sorry? You didn't study the victims. Oh, yes, I Interview did. the victims? Absolutely. Did you read what I wrote? I yes, I did. So. I think you read what was written about me, but not what I wrote. Okay, and I'd urge you to go back to read the stories that I wrote on January 18th, February 1st, every day out of Gaza. Every day. Would urge you to do that. I don't think that I talk too much to the idea, but that's why we have more than one paper. You can read another one too. Yes, sir. Um, actually, I was reading uh, every day what you've written, and uh, one or two stories did strike me. I, uh, I'm going to quote you something uh, that was written uh, during the Gaza invasion. Quote, I remember once when a soldier waited, wanted to take a coat from a store, and he was stopped by his fellow soldiers because it was the wrong thing to do. Uh, this was uh, after the idea of actually killed 300 uh, children in Gaza. And my question is, uh, were you hard pressed during the slaughter of civilians in Gaza to maintain this myth of the IDF being somehow moral, uh, a more moral army than other armies. Was that, uh, that must have been really hard for you because I thought you were really searching with this uh, secondhand quote about a co uh, somebody restoring a coat. So was that difficult What's for the last you? part? Uh, was that difficult for you because- I got the first part. What was the last part? Uh, the last part, I think that was my only question. Great. Was that a, a difficult for you to maintain the myth of the IDF, especially when they were slaughtering uh, 1,400 people? Was Not that, hard for me. All right, that's, I just asked my question. Thank you. Easy for you. That's Great. my answer. It was easy for them. No, it wasn't easy. I didn't feel any need. No need, no need whatever. I don't consider the, the IDF to be a particularly more moral than any other army. I've already, it always has struck me 
But when the Israeli government keeps saying we're the most morally army in the world, they keep going, really? What makes you say so?